Okay, yeah, thanks for inviting me and thanks for coming. This is uh, sort of uh, really something new, fresh off the notepad, so to say. And I sort of tried to understand something new, and this is what I came up with, trying to apply a technique to a completely new topic. So uh, the topic of this will be um, uh, parabolic Higgs bundles on toric varieties. And um, well, before I start, let me say, um, as uh, Johannes has already mentioned as well, please feel free to interrupt at any time you would uh, like to ask a question. I'm happy to, uh, to just uh, diverge a little bit from the prepared uh, notes, just because uh, well, if I'm talking and talking and talking and nobody's asking questions, chances are people get lost and that's not good either. So, um, and if they're not getting lost, it's also good, then, um, well, then I'd just like to hear from you anyway. Okay, um, let me start with a basic question, which is, um, which has been asked many, many times, and, um, well, I'll ask it again. So X should be, yeah, should be a compact Riemann surface, and the question is, how do you classify all holomorphic vector bundles of, of a fixed rank R on uh, this compact Riemann surface? And I mean, it's in general not solved, but because you cannot expect to solve such a question, of course. Um, but uh, let's start with some results that are known, which I'm sure you are mostly familiar with, but I'm still going to mention them. First one is this now very classical result by, in a way, Birkhoff, but mostly Grotendieck, which says that if we are in the genus zero case, namely that um, our Riemann surface is really a projective one space, then we know that um, the, each vector bundle uh, splits as a direct sum of line bundles, or in other words, the associated sheaf is just a finite sum over these uh, line bundle, standard line bundles, or tautological line bundles on, the, uh, on P1. So that you all know, and this is something I I'm hoping I will get to teach my students towards the end of this semester when I'm teaching this material. So this is something very, this is sort of the starting point for today. So you could ask, okay, genus zero, that's great. What about genus one? That's also hopefully not too bad. That's an elliptic curve. Well, here we also know something. And the point is that uh, what Atia did, he ended up studying the moduli space of indecomposable vector bundles of a fixed degree on an elliptic curve. And notice, uh, notice that, um, well, all of these vector spaces for different degrees, they are end up being um, uh, isomorphic. And in fact, they're all isomorphic uh, to the elliptic curve itself, which is uh, somewhat, in some sense, a bit reminiscent of the fact that, uh, well, for line bundles, the, uh, the Jacobian of an elliptic curve is also isomorphic to the elliptic curve. And similarly, you also, this is, I have to say, this is not a canonical isomorphism. This depends on the choice of some base point that S. Okay, so we have just dealt with the first two um, cases. And I guess uh, the first case is something you could in principle have encountered in an advanced class. The second one is not, that, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful paper, uh, but I think this is something you might not have encountered in a, in, in a class setting. And of course, the more general case is that when genus is greater or equal to two, and that's uh, there, we don't really have a full classification, but we have something, and this is this uh, also classical theorem by Narasimhan and Seshadri, um, who I believe both have passed away recently, which is a bit sad, but anyway. Um, if um, the genus of X is greater or equal to two, then uh, their result says that there's a natural one-to-one -one correspondence. Question? Sorry, was it a question? Or was it just noise? Um, maybe it was noise, okay. Uh, so a statement says that if you look at stable vector bundles, where you have this uh, the sort of the some form of uh, stability condition, which is uh, an inequality for uh, a, a quotient of degrees and ranks uh, for subbundles and, and so on and so on. So a special type of vector bundles, which generalizes the notion of an uh, indecomposable vector bundle from up there. And we want this to be of rank R and we're focusing on the degree zero case. Then these things are in fact in a natural one-to-one -one correspondence 
with irreducible representations of the fundamental group of X into the unitary group. And the R is the same as the one over here, of course. Okay. So now um, this is sort of uh, the, uh, the, the, the story that we ended up with, I think in the late 60s, beginning 70s already, where, um, where we sort of uh, asked the question, okay, what happens on a compact event surface? Um, the next step, now we are coming into slightly more modern territory is, um, you might wonder why there is really irreducible, I mean, irreducible might not be that, it's a bit surprising, but it's not terribly surprising because you want stable on that side. But why is there this unitary group? What happens if we replace the unitary group on the right-hand side just by the usual type of uh, representations, namely representations into GLR? And well, that is also something that is known, but that's a, a very intricate result that in fact also works over any smooth projective variety and in parts maybe also over uh, Kähler varieties. I do not want to go into details what the exact uh, prerequisites are. Smooth projective variety will be enough in this case. And here we know, and that's a result, uh, I think for the compact Riemann surfaces due to Colette and then in general by Carlos Simpson, which says that uh, instead of, I mean, if we replace the, the, the sort of uh, the, 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 yeah, the set or category of irreducible representations on the right hand side from unitary to general representations, then you need to add further data on the left hand side. And the data you want to add is exactly a, well, a vector bundle together with a so called Higgs field. And the Higgs field uh, is. Um, pretty much, um, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's essentially a, a linear map from this vector bundle, from the vector bundle you have into the vector bundle tensor, the, uh, the one forms on your variety. And, um, and you want that if you apply this twice, meaning that you end up in E tensor omega x2, so the two forms that this end, ends up being zero. And I mean, you want the same rank, you want uh, uh, now, not the degree to be zero, but something more general. You want the total churn class of your vector bundle to be zero, and you want uh, any sort of uh, stability means something slightly different in the Higgs bundle setting because you're sort of only checking it for subspaces that are compatible with phi. Okay, and that is and sort of this result is considered um, a very deep and, in fact, uh, also a very analytic um, story. And in fact, not um, not just complex analytic, because but really that um, this correspondence is actually real analytic. I mean, or smooth, or home, or, or like uh, or, or continuous. But it's definitely not an algebraic correspondence. And it's also not complex analytic. It's really real analytic. But then, if I, if you allow me to ask, why do you need the algebraic assumption that X is smooth projective? Uh, I, that's why I'm saying I think uh, this will also hold for Kähler variety okay. for Kähler manifold. I think, um, but um, there might be further conditions that I'm not completely aware of that are automatically fulfilled for smooth projective varieties. And in the end, uh, I want to put a toric variety here, right? So um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, and in fact, if you want to think of this in terms of a moduli space or moduli spaces, and on the one hand side, we have a moduli space of uh, stable Higgs bundles that is usually called uh, the Dolbo moduli space. Of a fixed rank, okay. And the Dol here stands for Dolbo moduli space. And well, on the right hand side, you have the so called Betty moduli space. And that is defined to be the character variety of the fundamental group of the compact Riemann surface. So that is the variety of irreducible representations from the fundamental group into GLR. And then you take the GIT quotient by conjugation by, uh, by GLR. Okay, um, so and this thing ends up being real analytic and just to illustrate where you can already see it, 
if um, X is a uh, compact Riemann surface and uh, we are considering the case R equals one, which has the advantage that the general linear group in R equals one case is uh, abelian. So it's just uh, GM. Then uh, the correspondence we have ends up being a correspondence between uh, the Jacobian of X cross the global sector, so uh, the global holomorphic one forms on X into uh, C star to the 2G. Um, so it has to be a bit careful. Uh, I mean, uh, you really have to sort of think this is now an abelian group. If this is an abelian group, it's given by wherever the generators are being sent as, as such a representation. But uh, since they're sort of, since it's abelian, they're also commuting with each other. So they're simultaneously diagonalizable. Then sort of uh, uh, modding out by this ends up giving you essentially just the diagonal, the diagonal matrices, well, because you have to leave uh, the unstable ones away and that it gives you all the eigenvalues. And then one has to be a tiny bit careful in the end really it gives you the eigenvalues and then you also modding out by permuting the eigenvalues but that happens because well it's uh, uh well it's it's an sn operation on an so you take the quotient or on gm to the n take the quotient it's again a gm to the n or c star to the n um yeah okay so that's the, on that side but on that side this is really um a vector space so it is um abstractly isomorphic to z to the g and this thing here is abstractly isomorphic to uh, uh, C to the G mod uh, C to the 2G, Z to the 2G. Um, and um, sort of, and if you now look carefully under the hood, I mean, this uh, sort of uh, the, the isomorphism is really given by taking polar coordinates, because this is sort of like an S1 to the 2G, and, uh, and this is an R to the 2G. And I mean, uh, and this will be identified with C star to the 2G by taking polar coordinates and maybe here a logarithm as well, the real logarithm. So, uh, wait, uh, the logarithm will be from here to there. Anyway. Okay, so the point is that um, whatever it is, I mean, if we are using polar coordinates to go from one side to the other, it means that um, it's not going to be something holomorphic at all. It's going to be something that is continuous, it's going to be smooth, and in fact, real analytic, as you can see in this example already. So um, that's sort of um, the background. And um, maybe I can wait for a second for questions before I now go into the more combinatorial part of this. Because that's sort of just background story as of now. Are there questions about the background story? Well, if you have questions, feel free to interrupt later as well. And sort of the sort of the part where it starts getting interesting to me is the following question, namely, um, what is the combinatorial content of this non-abelian Hodge correspondence? So, I mean, the proof of uh, of this uh, thing up here is uh, in a way very analytic. It, it goes via uh, so a, a certain type of harmonic functions to uh, symmetric spaces and so on. And I mean, in the end, I have to say, I just, I don't understand the proof just because it's um, techniques that are not really familiar to me. So I'm wondering, are there cases where you can actually explicitly and combinatorially describe this correspondence um, without having to work with this uh, uh, rather big bulk of um, uh, analytic machinery? And I mean, um, the first case, I was like, OK, um, I like uh, combinatorial objects in algebraic geometry. So what's our favorite combinatorial object? It's, of course, a toric variety. So a uh, quest uh, price question for everyone who's here. Um, what's the fundamental group of a toric variety? Is it Z to the N? Mm, no, I mean, depends. What toric variety are you looking at? 
I mean, um, uh, let me phrase this question more precisely. What's the fundamental group of a complete toric variety? Trivial? Sorry? Trivial? Simply connected. Yeah, exactly. They're zero. So um, directly applying this to a toric variety, in particular, if you want something that's compact, is going to not give something very interesting just because, um, well, uh, well, the fundamental group is zero. That's why the character variety has to be zero. So you also don't expect really uh, much to happen in this uh, with this correspondence. So the part that is more interesting, though, is to um, use a, a variant of the story, namely a, a variant of this non-abelian Hodge correspondence um, for um, so-called parabolic vector bundles. And um, uh, that allows us to um, prove the following, which is, well, maybe it's really just a small exercise uh, for experts in the field, but um, I was quite happy to find it. So um, if X is a uh, smooth and complete, so a compact toric variety over the complex numbers in this case, and we want the big torus to be called T, then there is a natural one-to-one -one correspondence between the stable parabolic Higgs bundles, and I will explain what parabolic, and I mean Higgs, I will also say something about later in this context, uh, on the toric variety. So there will be uh, just this vector bundle. And I mean, um, well, in the end, uh, since we're in a complete case, it's, uh, we end up being uh, able to use some form of Gaga result. So it doesn't matter whether we're working with algebraic or holomorphic ones. Then there's this extra structure on the vector bundle that's just the parabolic one over here and the Higgs field. But now the Higgs field ends up not going to the one forms, but to the logarithmic one forms. So logarithmic with respect to the uh, to the toric boundary. So I mean, this thing is in fact uh, isomorphic to M, the no uh, to M, the character lattice. But I will I'll say a few words about this. And uh, this thing, uh, and, and sort of this, uh, this well, category, I guess, of rank R, together with, um, this is also a bit cryptic. I would like to write the total churn class, but it's not. It's a bit, uh, something slightly more complicated. It actually is um, something that I would like to dub the parabolic um, total churn class, which is, only in some cases the, the total churn class, but usually not. So you need to take into account the parabolic structure here. And I guess what I wanted to say is, that, well, what is actually the differentials with logarithmic singularities? Well, a toric variety, those are easy too. So those are just, uh, well, differentials, abelian differentials with logarithmic singularities along the toric boundary. And those can be canonically identified with omega x tensor m, where m is just uh, the character lattice of the torus. So I mean, and it's a reasonably simple object. And uh, then I haven't really explained anything about the right-hand side. I mean, representations, sure, that's still there. Um, I mean, GLR, I hope we understand GLR. I might want to make a claim later that we don't understand GLR, but for now we understand it. And, um, but uh, for, uh, I'm also writing something that looks very fancy, but is something very easy. Namely the logarithmic fundamental group of um, X, which I mean, if you want to speak log geometry, you can do it. But in the end, what I mean here is the fundamental group of the big torus. And that thing is in fact, canonically isomorphic to the uh, homomorphisms from a GM into T. I mean, we have a map in this direction that turns out to be uh, an isomorphism, and that is, of course, nothing but the dual to M. Okay, so um, for now, I didn't really say anything, right? Because I wrote down a theorem. I said, uh, well, this we now understand, but this we, I use lots of words, Higgs bundles, okay, maybe we understand a little bit from above. Parabolic, I didn't really say what that means, even if there is a definition out there. And this is something completely new. So I really have to explain to you what are parabolic, first vector bundles, then later Higgs bundles on a toric variety, and uh, what is the parabolic total churn class. And um, yeah, let me maybe just make a few remarks before I do so. 
So um, you might wonder, is it really necessary to work with a smooth toric variety? Um, my suspicion is not, but so far I can only deal with the case of a toric orbifold, namely a simplicial toric variety. And then I work with sort of this canonical stacky resolution and uh, that is smooth again. And with that, on, on that thing, you have a similar result where you have to use a few different words to actually uh, make this a true statement. Um, as of now, I do not know how to deal with non-simplicial singular toric varieties, but I strongly suspect that there will be a result like this. I just don't know it. And um, to be on the safe side, um, there is a very different work by Takuro Moshizuki, um, which uh, works just on a smooth variety with an SNC divisor and proves a correspondence I don't fully understand, but it's quite possible that what I'm trying to prove here with very explicit means would also follow from his result. Okay, and um, you might also wonder, uh, well, are we bound to toric varieties here? Well, I mean, Talking about parabolic bundles and about Higgs bundles, that's something we can probably just do with an SNC pair as well. Um, the place where we are really bound to a toric variety is this parabolic total churn class, where I don't quite know how to generalize it from the toric variety setting to anything uh, more general. But um, such a generalization must exist. It's just, um, I don't know how to do it. Okay. Questions at this point? If not? Mark? Yes. Okay. Is there a, an extension for semi-stable X bundle and then the word representation and not just uh, the irreducible one? Uh, sorry, um, can you repeat the last sentence? Uh, uh, yeah. On the right hand side, you have polystable uh, vector bands in this case. On the right. Uh, 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 so, no, sorry, um, you have polystable ones on the left, sorry, and uh, I mean, meaning um, sums. So, uh, when, and on the, on the right hand side, you have semi simple representations, if that helps. Uh, but when you say that the representation are irreducible, I thought that uh, you, you don't allow to have polystable objects. Yeah, I, I so don't do it here, but I mean, um, that I want to put semi simple here and then, um, okay. Okay, okay, perfect. Yeah. Oh, 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 right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit. Well, oh, there's another corollary I wasn't aware of. Um, well, in this case, you can also sort of prove a baby version of the moduli space um, result. Um, well, let me just quickly explain it. Um, I mean, a Betty moduli space, again, we're in the abelian situation. So this is nothing but uh, homomorphisms to uh, GLR. With the argument above, if we uh, take this GIT quotient, what we end up getting is just uh, M tensor uh, C star to the R. And the left hand side, if you stare at it for a while, you can convince yourself. I mean, that's sort of the level at this point, but um, well, if you look at it more carefully, you can actually show it, that this is uh, the same thing as MR tensor S1 to the R. And I mean, uh, now the uh, then you can see that these two things are actually isomorphic using again polar coordinates, saying that, well, C star is nothing but R cross S1. And I mean, um, yeah, I mean, really all the content is in the above, um, I mean, most of the content, you have to be a tiny bit careful when you go from that sort of from this to the quotient. You have to look a little bit here what exactly the modulized space is, but the content is really this, that we sort of understand this correspondence in very explicit terms. Okay, and as I just wanted to say before this corollary, let's now talk about the more technical parts, namely about what are the objects I just made a uh, statement about. Okay, so what is a parabolic bundle? And um, unfortunately, there are many different definitions in the uh, literature. So I will give uh, yet a slightly different one. Um, the one that I'm giving is at least in the case where you have a smooth variety and an SNC divisor on it, equivalent to the one that uh, is in the literature. But for example, if you are working with uh, even orbifold, I mean, um, well, orbifold singularities already, or I mean, uh, or some other type of toric thing, it's uh, not going to be a, uh, like that. You have to be a bit more careful. 
Okay, but in our situation, that is the one that works. So a parabolic bundle or vector bundle on the thing that is bit, a bit uh, on x comma d, where x is a smooth variety and d is an SNC divisor with uh, irreducible and smooth components di, that's SNC as opposed to NC, is um, the following. It's a vector bundle E on x of a certain rank together with a collection of filtrations of uh, the restriction of E onto, uh, oh, this is um, not completely correct. It has to be a DI, otherwise it's not right. And uh, it, uh, um, I mean, and I mean the filtration here is sort of indexed by some value alphas between zero and one. But um, I mean, this is, a, I mean, this is something finite dimensional. This, this will be finite dimensional thing. So really, we are interested only in finitely many of these alphas where the dimension is changing. But I mean, for formal, I mean, for formal reasons, I'm writing it like this. And we want to have that this is a, a reasonable filtration, so that it starts at zero and it ends at uh, the full space. Okay, so that's uh, essentially, um, well, it means uh, we have, uh, I mean, what does this now mean for a toric uh, variety? Um, well, it means that for every ray in the, um, in the fan, so for every, uh, well, boundary, irreducible boundary divisor, you end up getting a filtration like this. And uh, well, you have to now um, maybe give a slight reinterpretation of this because for toric varieties, things are simpler in the sense that sort of everything is happening in the boundary. So uh, there should be nothing interesting happening uh, on the torus itself. And uh, well, how does this work? Uh, what's the exact statement for this? So suppose we have now a smooth toric variety with some boundary divisor and uh, well, and the boundary divisor is now um, sort of indexed. Uh, it's uh, irreducible divisors are indexed by the rays of the um, well, of the fan that defines the toric variety. And we suppose we have a vector bundle given on this toric variety. Then we fix the fiber of this vector bundle over the point one in the torus. That's this thing here. So one is the uh, in the torus. Then um, putting um, parabolic structures on this vector bundle is uh, really the same thing as uh, putting a family of filtrations onto this vector space V that we de uh, denote by V rho alpha, where alpha is indexed between zero and one. And I mean, okay, they have to satisfy equivalent conditions to one and two above so that it starts at zero and ends at uh, the full space. And how will you translate this? Well, um, essentially what you're doing is you're using the evaluation map that takes this vector bundle E and sends it to its restriction on a um, uh, on one of those reducible boundary devices. And uh, well, and then you take uh, sort of pre images, restrict them to uh, the fiber over one, and you get families of filtrations in this one particular fiber. Okay, so really what we have, we have learned now is that uh, parabolic bundle is some kind of weird, I'm not weird, but it's sort of a bit of a strange structure that is uh, sort of centered around the boundary in, in general. But for toric varieties, we can just pull it back to the fiber over one. So if you have heard about toric vector bundles, this should already ring a bell. But if it, if you haven't, then uh, well, I'll get to it. But first, let me quickly give a reinterpretation of these uh, parabolic uh, structures, or, uh, or, that's, or sort of uh, well, parabolic bundles in a way, or on a toric variety at least. So let V be a finite dimensional complex vector space then we now think of this as being some non-Archimedean field with the trivial absolute value. Then a non-Archimedean norm on this vector space is nothing but a map to the non-negative real numbers that is uh, positive definite, meaning that it is being sent to zero if and only if this V is zero. It is, uh, well, a multiplicatively linear, Meaning that if we multiply one of those vectors, then it is this, that then sort of the norm stays the same. 
Well, I mean, formally, this means you can pull out the lambda, but then lambda is an element in C, so that is going to be, uh, well, okay, fair enough. I should probably write it because we could, we could be zero, right? I mean, right? I mean, in, or, or I put, uh, if I don't want this, I can also put this here. I mean, both of these things would work. Okay, and um, the other thing is we also want this non archimedean triangle inequality to hold, namely that V plus W is less than equal to the maximum of the absolute value of V and the absolute value of W. And um, we say that such a non archimedean norm is bounded if it holds that, uh, well, non archimedean norm of V is always less than equal to one for all elements in the vector space. So, um, okay, this sounds like this is something completely different, but it is actually very related. And this is a, there's a sort of a cool, a nice uh, corollary of this. Namely, um, well, if we take a one dimensional, uh, no, a, a, a five dimensional vector space V as above, then giving a bounded non Archimedean norm on this vector space is really the same thing as, the, uh, as taking such a filtration of V that satisfy I and 2I. I mean, the fact that it starts at zero and ends at, uh, uh, at uh, infinity. Uh, not infinity, at the whole space. What nonsense. Uh, and I mean, um, how do you, how, how does this correspondence work? Well, um, you take such a bounded non Archimedean norm. And um, well, you have to check that uh, you get a filtration V alpha such that uh, well, it's all the V in V such that the non Archimedean norm of uh, V is less than equal to alpha. And now we let alpha go between uh, zero and one. That's the reason why the filtrations had to be defined with this weird alpha in the beginning. And well, if you have, and I mean, and then the claim is that this is already a subspace that follows from the, I mean, essentially using this strong triangle or the non triangle inequality. And I mean, well, okay, uh, for alpha zero, you end up getting the zero subspace. Well, that's the first property here. And uh, well, and, uh, and it, for uh, alpha one, we end up getting the full subspace. That's where we know that this thing is bounded. So every vector has to be less than equal to one. Okay, so um, now we have seen that uh, those filtrations that come up from, um, uh, from uh, parabolic structures on vector bundles, at least on a vector space can be reinterpreted as uh, giving this vector space a bounded non archimedean norm. Okay, and now uh, let's do this. Um, can I generalize it to a uh, smooth toric variety with big torus T, then um, sort of uh, parabolic bundles on this are now nothing but um, vector bundles on the smooth toric varieties with a T invariant non Archimedean nor uh, bounded. I have should I should say bounded here. Otherwise, it's not correct. Uh, uh, T invariant non Archimedean norm on X. So maybe I have to say a few words. Um, that, uh, I mean, well, I did sort of say one of these things. I did not say one of these things. This also has to be continuous, but continuous in the sense that if you take the Berkowitz analytic spaces of, uh, of, the, of the, the total space and X itself, then these have some nice topology, and sort of uh, and sort of the norm should be continuous with respect to this topology at least, and uh, well there should be t invariant. If it's not t invariant, we, we can do anything, and I mean then it will definitely not be something nice that is only uh, centered around the boundary. And the point is, uh, well, if we choose it to be t invariant then these non archimedean norms uh, are on the on the vector bundle they are again determined on what happens over one and over one we understand it because non archimedean norms on the vector space are the same thing as filtrations okay and um, well i mean some of you might have heard the term toric vector bundle and now i'm going to give an example that explains how these uh, show up in uh, this language 
And I mean, everything I'm saying is, of course, heavily influenced by what people have done with toric vector bundles. And I mean, part of the, the reason I sort of I thought about this was because I wanted to understand what toric vector bundles have to do with uh, parabolic bundles. So let E, this example, just be a toric vector bundle. What is that? Uh, well, it is uh, a vector bundle together with a tor with an action of the big torus of X on this vector bundle, such that it acts linearly on each of the fibers. Then, um, well, if we have such a toric vector bundle, then we can consider array in the um, band defining the toric variety and for a U in N, that should be, uh, I mean, that should be a co-character in the torus. And we take U to be the minimal generator, I mean, minimal integral generator of that ray. Then associated to this datum, we can define a um, monarchimedian norm on the fiber over one, which does the following. Well, I mean, we take V, that's just an element in the fiber over one. We take um, rho of T, that's uh, the, the, that is one parameter subgroup. We then look at the limit of this as T goes to zero. And uh, now take sort of the order of this thing along the boundary divisor. Uh, now I'm confusing myself. So we take uh, e to the minus, that's just to make it into a norm, order along the corresponding boundary divisor for V in V, which was just a fiber over one. Then I'm claiming that this thing defines a, a non-Archimedean, I mean, it defines many norms because we let it uh, vary over rho on this V. And then we can extend it torus invariantly to all of E. Um, so yeah. Can I quickly uh, ask? So the exponent you want u of t, not rho of t. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yes, that would of course be stupid. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Completely, you're completely right. Yes. Okay. Um, sort of. Uh, this is sort of uh, where the sort of uh, some ideas here come from because. People have sort of studied uh, these filtrations on toric varieties in the context of toric vector bundles a lot. And um, well, for, uh, uh, via this construction, you get the non archimedian norm. The set of non archimedian norms is bigger than what is coming from toric vector bundles because you can sort of continuously interpolate between the somewhat restrictive uh, norms you have here. But um, well, in uh, in general, sort of, you can still use this story to uh, get a lot of ideas of how to deal with these uh, non-Archimedean norms in general. And what is really funny is, if you look at the original paper of Piaschko, he actually writes down this norm, but uh, then people haven't caught up on it later because they thought, oh, we don't want to do non-Archimedean norms, and well, now we, uh, now I'm claiming I want to do it, and so it was great to read this old paper of Piaschko, and uh, well, he tells me how to do it, so to say. Okay. Um, in a way, therefore, you can say that theorem B uh, generalizes the classification of toric vector bundles by Kliashko. I mean, just because uh, well, um, toric vector bundles are now a subclass of parabolic bundles from this perspective. And there you go. Um, now, the next step is, um, can you also give a different way of approaching, um, I mean, that has been in the literature actually, but um, uh, of thinking about these uh, toric vector bundles and more generally about the parabolic vector bundles. Well, you can take N of V to be the space of non-Archimedean norms on this vector space V. I mean, it's, uh, it's for now just a set, but you can easily put a topology on it. 
And um, well, it, it turns out that this thing actually is, uh, well, it, it has some nice polyedral structure and it is, well, almost what I would like to call the Bruchatitz building of uh, GLR, but that's not an official uh, name, so I should not really say that, but um, I'll say it anyway. Um, what is uh, what is this thing? I mean, I might not give a full, I mean, it is literally the same thing as the space of non archimedean norms, but the interesting part is that sort of, um, there are subspaces of the space that are uh, linear, that sort of they are really isomorphic to uh, V itself. And they are just glued in a funny way. So it's like a lot of copies of V are glued in a funny, but pull, uh, but in a sort of, in a very infinite, but locally finite and polyhedral way together. And it's sort of a huge object with, uh, which still locally has this linear structure. And in fact, there's even an integral structure that comes from the, uh, the character lattices of each of the tori in GLN. And um, yeah, uh, so um, well, then sort of uh, from that perspective, one can think of a parabolic structure on a vector bundle uh, or on a, well, in this case as a, as a rotate, no, it's actually on, on, on the vector bundle. It's the same thing as a, uh, well, a piecewise all linear map from the fan of the toric right into the space of non archimedean norms. So what does this mean? It means that if you restrict this map to a cone, then the cone chooses one of those linear subspaces of, uh, 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 of, of this Buhatitz building. And it tells you that uh, it is uh, sort of restricted to the cone. It is linear with respect to that linear uh, image structure. And sort of uh, choosing that, you end up getting um, uh, another way of classifying these um, parabolic vector bundles. And it has to be all linear. If we make it uh, Z linear, we get uh, toric uh, vector bundles back. And I mean, um, sort of uh, the place where this has shown up uh, as well is the way the work of uh, Kumas Kawe and Chris Manin, where they also classify toric vector bundles in terms of two Hitz buildings. Okay. Um, as a small side part of story here, we also obtain, well, it's not small, we need it later, but I'm just gonna say that in particular, if we use this perspective, we end up getting piecewise linear, piecewise, uh, all linear maps, psi i, from delta, into the real numbers. And I mean, um, well, that is just, uh, I mean, take the map here for each of, I mean, uh, and take sort of each of the components. And I mean, uh, there you go. Okay. Now I'm just doing a bit of bookkeeping for later. So X should be, a, now if X is a smooth variety and D is a SNC divisor on it, then the standard definition in the literature is the following, a parabolic Higgs bundle on X is a parabolic vector bundle together with a uh, uh, such a Higgs field uh, from E now not in, uh, into E tensor omega one, but into T tensor omega one, log, uh, sort of the logarithmic one forms on uh, with respect to this boundary divisor. And I mean, this is not any just any such linear map, but it has to be compatible with the filtrations on here and the induced filtrations here. And it has to fulfill that, well, if we apply it twice, it's equal to zero because we're in a higher dimensional situation now. So that's, well, that, that's sort of uh, 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 the standard definition from the literature. And um, then we now know that uh, if we understand what parabolic vector bundles is, where I tried to convince you that there is sort of a, a, a host of different ways of thinking about them, then we can also rather straightforwardly write down at least what a, uh, well, a parabolic Higgs bundle is. And we can actually work with it is a, diff a different story, but in sort of, in the case of a toric variety, we can. Okay, now, um, What's the next step? The next step is that I have to tell you what is this um, parabolic total churn class. 
And um, this is one place where we are really using the smoothness of the toric variety and the fact that we're working over on the toric variety. Um, I, I'm sure there are generalizations of this, but as of now, I'm not aware of them. I mean, they exist somewhere, but people might not have come up with it. So, so say we have a smooth toric variety X and say it's complete or compact. Then uh, there is a natural isomorphism between the singular cohomology ring and uh, uh, the ring of um, piecewise polynomial functions on the fan with values in R, uh, with, with coefficients in R, sorry. So um, what is that? Well, we can say that this is nothing but uh, functions from the support of the fan into R. And F restricted to sigma should just be well, a polynomial um, or, I mean, or an element in the symmetric algebra of um, M sigma R for all uh, sigma. So whenever we restrict it to one of those uh, cones in the fan, then it has to be poly a polynomial. And well, the, 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 the formal notation means that we take M sigma to be uh, M modulo um, M intersected with the orthogonal comp uh, complement of sigma. And I mean, okay, this is sort of the formal definition, but really what it means is, well, it is uh, the restriction to each of the cones is a polynomial with coefficients in R. Okay. Almost there. Now we define what we call the the, the sort of the, the total parabolic churn class. Um, and I'm saying here that this definition is due to Sampain, but um, really there's a result due to Sampain that says if we're on a smooth toric variety and we're given a toric vector bundle, then the actual topological total churn class is uh, given by whatever I'm defining here. But uh, I'm now sort of uh, using his result uh, as a definition that ge to generalize it from toric vector bundles to uh, to parabolic vector bundles. So what I'm, I end up doing, so we say that EI should be the eth elementary symmetric polynomial in R variables. Then, um, then the total parabolic churn class that we denote with this funny notation is so that should be an element in this uh, cohomology ring. And uh, it is given by taking one plus, then take this first uh, symmetric, elementary symmetric polynomial, evaluated in those psi one up to psi r that we got from the construction up there uh, before, namely from the map to the Bua Tits building, then it was piecewise linear, and then just sum it up up to the rth um, symmetric, uh, elementary symmetric polynomial, evaluated those piecewise linear r linear functions. And uh, well, that is just a definition that generalizes from, well, an actual result from earlier. And I mean, this should be, I guess, uh, what we call C1, and this should be up to CR. And uh, well, this is something that um, uh, turns out to be the same as in the literature, what is called uh, the parabolic degree of, uh, a vector of a parabolic vector bundle. Okay. So I guess my time is now at an end, but oh, maybe, I mean, I was told 50 minutes or 60, do I have five more minutes or? Yeah, take as much time as you want. Well, not as much as I want, I hope. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. Five minutes I will take and then I'll stop. Okay, um, and now um, in order to prove now the final result, uh, at least uh, let's say proof theorem B, namely the, or sort of uh, proof a, a weaker version, namely, that unitary uh, representations of the fundamental group of the torus are in fact uh, uh, in a one-to-one -one correspondence with um, uh, stable parabolic vector bundles with vanishing Higgs field. So, I mean, just the usual thing, sort of a, a toric uh, Narasimhan Seshadrish theorem, if you like, uh, that will be based on the following elementary linear algebra lemma, which I find more remark the more remarkable the longer I think about it. So uh, suppose we have oh, suppose we have uh, some partition of the number r given, an ordered partition. Then we can consider the flag variety 
uh, with respect to the, the sizes, namely it's just a variety of such flags, such that the dimension of uh, the, those uh, successive quotients are just given by the KIs. And uh, this flag variety is in fact a, uh, we usually write it as GLN modulo some parabolic subgroup, but now I want to write it differently by using the, the, the standard Hermitian inner product on Z to the N, I want to write it as unitary matrices, Modulo, um, a product of these uh, subgroups of unitary, also of these block diagonal unitary matrices. And um, that will be the way to um, sort of, I mean, this type of isomorphism will allow us to translate from unitary representations to flags. That's sort of, uh, that's really what makes this whole story go. So let me maybe. Just a sketch of a uh, sketch of what is going on in this correspondence. Say we consider a an open torus invariant of a uh, sub variety or uh, U row that has only one toric torus boundary, a uh, toric boundaries, that means it's associated to array. Then this thing is very simple. It always has to be isomorphic to C star, well, to the n, n minus 1, cross A1, because singularities don't matter in this case. And let gamma be a uh, simple loop uh, around the boundary. I mean, um, What this means is we take a simple loop around zero in A1. So that's, I mean, just elementary geometry, really. Uh, then, um, well, suppose we are given a representation from the fundamental group of the torus into the unitary group. Then we can look at the image of this gamma. And um, this thing, if you are choosing your basis well, I mean, um, well, up to conjugation, can be diagonalized, so just back to linear algebra. And uh, well, we can diagonalize it in a way that we get sort of um, some alpha ones up here, up to um, alpha L. That's just uh, sort of diagonalized and uh, sorted in a way, um, well, uh, such that, well, alpha one is less than equal to alpha two and so on up to alpha L. So we just want them. Um, I mean, like we can always do by just changing the basis or uh, permuting the basis. And then with the above lemma, we see that uh, this really gives is the same thing as giving us a filtration of the vector space that is just generated by the corresponding basis vectors um, uh, in which this is diagonalized. And in order to make a filtration that we had just wrote down, we find the many things into a filtration as we had defined it before, we just need to say at which points uh, we are changing the um, uh, we are changing the, the dimension of the subspace and we just say, well, we do it at alpha one, alpha two, and alpha L over here. And um, do, I think that is the correct direction. I hope I do not make a mistake. So that gives us the filtration and that gives us the parabolic structure at, um, uh, at one of the boundary divisors. And now we have to use the, uh, the total parabolic degree condition, the being zero condition, to see that this whole thing um, is compatible when you go from one direction to the other. I mean, if you're going into in, in orthogonal directions, it's not a problem. The compatibility is automatic. But what could happen is that you have a ray from one thing in the, uh, and to the other end, and then you really need some condition that tells you that you don't get new data by putting a parabolic structure on the opposite end of your fan. And I mean, and so you sort of have to work through this. And I mean, this also makes use of the fact that um, we're working with a smooth toric variety because then you can take an integral basis and all. Um, so, and if we're using that, 
sort of this fact, um, then um, well, since th this uh, total, let's call this E alpha, uh, and that should be taken x by rho, that this is zero, we end up getting a parabolic structure overall. Okay, then, well, then now with all the things we did, we can sort of translate what a Higgs field is into some also linear algebra terms. And um, we um, can also find it here again. And then stability can also be translated by various categorical equivalences from earlier. So um, I will think I will stop here. I mean, I just sort of give you the linear algebra gist of what's happening, but for toric variety, um, this is really all that's happening. Um, and I think that's really the place where I want to stop because I don't want to keep you for too long. So thanks for listening if you are um, still here, so to say. <laughs>